Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, Tom, for that gracious introduction. Thank you to all of you for coming out on a beautiful June evening uh, to talk about capitalism, about nature, and about where we are headed in the 21st century and what we are going to do about it. At the core of this is an argument that we need a new way to carry on the conversation around how humans, human activity, human organizations from families to empires and world markets fit within the web of life, how these forms of human social relations uh, make the web of life, but also how they are made by the web of life and what, it, what does that mean for how we usually think about history, about the crisis today, and about the politics of forging an emancipatory and uh, sustainable agenda for the future. So let's begin with, that's not what I'm supposed to hear. Here we go, sorry. Oh, come on, there we go. Did we get there? Yes, yeah. so let's begin with what I call the central idea of green thought. And by green thought, I mean that extraordinary uh, uh, tradition of both human-oriented uh, and nature-oriented uh, uh, research that aims to entangle the problems of humans and the problem of nature. This usually goes under the rubric of environmental studies. Uh, it should go without saying that I am an extraordinary fan of green thought. And at the same time, I think we are at the moment where green thought or red green thought needs to be reinvented. So green thought's central problematic is what does capitalism do to nature? This is uh, the metaphor of the ecological footprint, which is not something I'm a big fan of, and we'll get to that later. But basically, this is the idea of capitalism is here, society is here, and it does certain things to nature. That's an important question. But I want to ask, what happens if we begin to turn that question inside out? What happens if we start to ask questions about how does capitalism put nature to work? And how do we look at capitalism as a way of organizing nature, keeping in mind that capitalism itself is transformed and co-produced by the web of life as well? But how do we put the politics and analytics of work at the center? So I want to say something fairly, I think, fairly straightforward, which is capitalism works not because it does terrible things to nature, it does, but because it has been successful at mobilizing and appropriating many natures and putting them to work for free or low cost. This is what I call capitalism as a system of cheap nature. And we will unpack that over the next hour or so. so the usual sense is that capitalism works by developing technologies that then suck dry the planet. This is the metaphor of depletion that comes from mining, that comes from uh, oil drilling, that comes from uh, 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 irrigation and bringing up water to uh, irrigate fields. And there is definitely a powerful reality to that. There's truth to that model. So. What I'm arguing is, well, yes, let's take the truth of that, but let's go a little bit farther. I think we can go farther than that. I think exhaustion is a much more complex issue politically and analytically than many environmentalists, including many environmental scholars, have recognized. And what I'm saying is that this is a question of the exhaustion of work, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that means. But what I want to say is that this terrible phrase that we get from from Marxist boy. If you've ever read a book on the law of value by a Marxist, it's a good thing to read before you go to sleep because, you know, you can go to sleep fast. Um, but we're going to, I'm going to say something. A law of value is a law of cheap nature and it's about thinking about what civilizations value and what capitalist civilization values, how it values, and what kinds of work it values, whose kinds of lives it values, and whose it doesn't. So. I want to say a few things about this because I think it says something about how capitalism has arrived at the present state of affairs in both some positive and, of course, also very destructive and negative ways. First, the invention of capitalism from the very beginning, from the age of Columbus, was also an invention of nature. And you'll notice I put an uppercase N there. And I put an uppercase N for a very particular reason. And that is that many humans 
We're not part of what was regarded as society or humanity, but we're re regarded as part of nature or largely part of nature. So from the beginning of capitalism, that meant that many humans, Africans, African slaves, indigenous peoples, uh, almost all women, uh, and even within Europe, Slavs, Jews, the Irish, Celtic peoples, these were not part of humanity. These were part of nature, and they were treated as savages or as otherwise as uh, objects to be put to work for free or low cost. So the invention of capitalism as this system of endless economic growth, as a system of endless capital accumulation, is premised on the transformation of the web of life into nature with the uppercase N, transforming the web of life into a force of production to advance labor productivity within a very narrow sphere. And when we say labor productivity, we need to recognize how narrow that definition is. Even, it's even narrower today. I'm going to use labor productivity in a Marxist sense of the production of surplus value. Uh, but we need to understand that that excluded the extraordinary unpaid work of, in Maria Mies, the Austrian Marxist term, women, nature, and colonies. That the pedestal of surplus value is the unpaid work of women, nature, and colonies. What this means, and this here we'll get, uh, we'll do a little bit of uh, really hardcore abstract political economy here, but the basic point is that socially necessary labor time, that is the average work embedded in the average commodity, forms not only through the commodity system, but through the appropriation of life and work outside the commodity system, but central to it. This is the enduring contribution of imperialism, but not only imperialism. The way that science and culture work within established regions of capitalist development also serve to yield up, to give up uh, uh, cheap life work in support of the commodity system, uh, but outside it. Uh, so the, the, the historic work of so-called housewives has been central to this. As uh, I say to my students in America, I say the Fordist house, the Fordist uh, uh, factory worker in the uh, uh, Ford or GM factory uh, uh, um, was the condition of the Fordist housewife and vice versa. So capitalist technology is not some magical alchemy that can yield gold out of lead. It works through specific dynamics. And it works through a specific relationship with cheap nature and therefore develops either on the frontiers or on the basis of cheap natures from the frontiers. So this is historically the case with the steam engine, which develops at the pit heads of coal mines to drain water. It was notoriously and famously inefficient in almost every sense, and it could only function at the pit heads of, at the, the, the very opening of mines so that uh, 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 because the coal was so cheap right there and it could draw the water out of the depths of the mines. But in fact, that was not a relationship that was invented in the 18th century with the steam engine. That was the history of technologies of capitalism from the very beginning. The great shipbuilding and cartographic revolutions of early capitalism were, uh, worked on that basis and so did the automobile revolution of the past century. So. Uh, and, and I want to make sure we're in the right place. So, of course, nature is never cheap. This is a conceit of capitalism. That is that there is there are two movements of cheap. For one of them is cheapening in price. That is driving down the necessary labor time in the reproduction of the main forms of cheap nature, what they call the four cheaps, labor power, food, energy, and raw material. And the basic idea, and it's quite, uh, quite evident in the economic history, is that every great era of world economic expansion has succeeded by reducing the price, the socially necessary labor time of labor, food, energy, and raw materials at the same time as expanding the material volume. The classic example of this is agricultural revolutions, all the way from the Dutch and the English in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries to the Green Revolution in the Punjab in the 1960s and 70s, produced more and more calories with less and less labor. And that really is essentially the basis of the four chiefs but it doesn't just occur, and historians of agriculture know this quite well and make this point quite clearly, it doesn't just occur because of new technologies. It occurs 
from the, the combination of knowledge, of agronomy, of, of uh, new, new tools, and of the fertility of the land. So it is a co-produced reality. But cheap in English means something else as well. It means to cheapen in a broadly cultural sense, to degrade, to treat as less worthy of respect and dignity. And so there is an important cheapening in this broadly cultural sense that goes on to cheapen and treat as, as lives and work with less dignity and to make less visible work carried on by women, nature, colonies, and other oppressed groups. So we need to understand that the questions of oppression and the questions of exploitation are dynamically and dialectically connected, and they're connected to the big questions of nature and sustainability. So I'm not just going to pick on green thought. I'm also going to pick on the Marxists. So the usual model is, well, capitalism is a system of the generalization of commodity production and exchange. Now, wait a minute. If for one moment, commodity production and exchange was generalized, nobody would be able to make a profit. It would simply be too expensive. It's much like uh, uh, what uh, uh, Wallerstein and Rigi always said about Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. If the world ever resembled Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, nobody would be able to make a profit. And at its core, what we need to see is that uh, uh, the commodity and commodification are part of the process, but they are islands of commodification. They are pivotal islands of commodification. They do indeed define capitalism, but not as an absolute reduction. Really, capitalism booms when islands of commodification and monetarization can draw upon oceans of cheap or potentially cheap nature. So, African slaves, Persian Gulf oil. There's a little excitement there. Uh, I'll try to watch my step. So Mississippi cotton, if we want to understand the Industrial Revolution, we have to look at not just the cheap coal, but the cheap uh, 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 cotton coming out of the Mississippi Delta and of the slaves who were expelled from humanity and rendered part of nature to produce this vital raw material for capitalism. So this is the basic model that we need to understand that there, are, there is a disproportionality that, that market life can only expand so far before it starts to impinge on this much bigger zone, what they call the zone of appropriation, where capitalism can find the four cheaps, labor, food, energy, and raw materials. And what we could, if we wanted to visualize this, and if I were better at doing it, I would uh, create a little GIF or something, we could see it pulsing. But there's also, there's a, qual there's a cyclical moment where this zone expands, there is a crisis of accumulation, and then the machineries of science and empire and states and developmentalism come in and try to extend this zone of appropriation. Those are the frontiers of capitalism that appear in every new era. Have you ever wondered why every new historical era of capitalism has a new imperialism? Well, it's to extend the zone of appropriation. Now, of course, it's about much more than this. But for the purposes of this argument, that is central. We need to understand that the politics of imperialism and the politics of sustainability have to be considered in the same thought, in the same conversation. So this is a disproportionality, and this is huge. That We have to understand this. This breaks both with environmentalist and Marxist ways of thinking through the core way that capital accumulation works. And in Web of Life, I spend part two of the book unpacking that idea that we need to have a theory. I'm not saying mine is the right one, but we need to have a conversation over a theory in which nature matters in some other way than merely a resource, merely an object to make cheap work. We need to see this disproportionality between the act of exploitation within the commodity system and the, the necessarily greater acts of appropriation of uncommodified or unpaid work of human and extra-human natures. So secondly, because of this disproportionality, the tendency towards the commodification of everything is asymptotic. It tends, of course, capitalism as a fantasy, as a project, uh, assumes well, everything will be marketized. And of course, that's embodied in neoclassical economics. So go to the economics department of virtually any major university, and they pretend as if, right, everything has or could or should be marketized. Well, that's a problem because capitalist production is intrinsically expensive. 
the costs always rise. And the more the commodification grows relative to appropriation, what you have is a squeeze on profitability. And the cheap means of offsetting costs is the cheap nature frontier. So there, there we have it. Every new era of, of capitalism is a new era of environmental history, a new era of scientific revolution, a new era of imperialism. They are all fitting together. And here we're bracketing, but I want to mention them, new eras of race and gender relations as well that are absolutely constitutive, not merely superstructures of these processes. So what my colleagues and I have been engaging in is not so much a theory, not, a, uh, it, it, not even one perspective, but a set of perspectives around a conversation, which we call the world ecology conversation. And the guiding question is, well, it goes beyond the normal sort of green argument, well, we're all part of nature. OK, well, we're all part of nature, but so what? What does it matter? How does that shape? our narratives of the world? How does it change how we understand the world? So what we are asking is how the accumulation of capital, the pursuit of power, and the co-production of nature form an organic and evolving whole. So this moves beyond what they call green arithmetic. That is nature plus society equals environmental history, environmental crisis, what have you. So green arithmetic was not bad, is not bad. It's just limited. It, in, in adding up nature plus society, you're adding up abstractions that have been treated as real. They are real abstractions in the making of the world that are part of the problem. Part of the problem is nature with an uppercase N and society with an uppercase S. So world ecology tries to move from humanity and nature to humanity in nature and nature in humanity. And it tries to move from seeing the world how capital sees it, that is, environment as object, to environment making. Now, humans aren't distinct in making environments. Beavers do it. Honeybees do it. All life makes environments. Humans are distinctive, however. And in my view, what is important, if we wish to understand how humans are distinct, is that we have to get away from assuming and presuming humanity's distinctiveness to seeing how humans fit into the web of life and how the web of life fits into what humans do. So in, in world ecology, we're not doing the ecology of the world, but ecology is what I call the oikos, the creative, generative, multi-layered relation of life making. It is a flow of flows, a dialectic of dialectics. And the oikos is the pulse of life making. I was uh, uh, in conversation uh, uh, earlier uh, uh, this afternoon, and I was saying how in Western languages, broadly conceived, we have no way of talking about that relation between humans and nature. We have no way of naming the relation of life making in which humans make environments, environments make humans. In many indigenous and non-Western languages, we do have words for that. So what I want to reintroduce into thinking that, thinking that relation between humans and nature is to name the relation. And that is the oikos. All right, so when I say capitalism is a world ecology, what I am trying to do is to say that there is a history in which all the forms of economy and culture and politics and so forth are always and at every turn bundled with and within the web of life. So nature matters, but how? Well, there are two answers to this question. One is what I would call the conventional eco-socialist or eco-Marxist answer. It says capitalism and nature. And this presumes the separation. It presumes humanity's separation from nature. It, is, it presumes the independence of these two domains of life and two domains of knowing, the ontological and epistemological domains. And this is not a view I share, obviously, but for a number of reasons. One is that it tends to feed into an idea that there are natural limits and there are social limits. And I think that that prevents us from seeing how the web of life, in particular forms of power and production and reproduction and oppression and exploitation, the class relations and the other uh, relations of oppression that work in capitalism, fit, fit in with the web of life. So I think that we uh, often, uh, uh, in this view, nature's external limits, we are led either to a view that nature will impose, as an external uh, limit, will impose an external limit to capitalism, or we're led to, to 
a view that capitalism can proceed indefinitely until the last tree is cut down, in the words of John Bellamy Foster. Uh, so green thoughts, double yes. Uh, 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 we need to understand that capitalism and nature has also been paired with capitalism in nature. And this doesn't say that capitalist natures are OK. It simply recognizes that there are some natures that human, humans make that are quite beautiful and quite lovely, uh, uh, parks and uh, uh, daycare centers and things like that. And there are some, some natures that humans make that are quite horrible, uh, 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 war, war landscapes in particular, uh, but landscapes of ecocide and genocide. Um, but what we are trying to do is take this broad idea that yes, of course, capitalism exists within nature and move it towards a, a more systematic uh, conversation in which capitalist, capitalism makes nature, but capitalism is also produced by nature. So here we get the Anthropocene argument. And what I want to highlight is this. There's one version of the Anthropocene argument pioneered by, as Tom mentioned in the introduction, uh, Earth system science, uh, scientists, um, scholars like Will Steffen, uh, Jan Zelasevich, uh, Paul Crutzen, and others who are overwhelmingly and primarily concerned with the geological record. And in that sense, the, the Anthropocene uh, conversation, I think, should be endorsed. But there's another Anthropocene argument, which is the Anthropocene argument endorsed by the New York Times. It is the Anthropocene argument endorsed by The Economist magazine, which basically loves the idea of the Anthropocene, or age of man, because it says, oh, look, the problems of the world are all our responsibility. They're not the responsibility of capitalists. They're not the responsibility of imperialists. They're the responsibility of all of humanity. But we have a tension in there. And I think the Anthropocene argument also registers an important and productive tension. That is that uh, uh, we have to have a way of thinking through the planetary crisis today that reckons with the extraordinary capacities of human beings and human organizations to transform planetary life. So we have this problem, this issue here of green arithmetic, that is society plus nature or capitalism plus nature if you're an eco-socialist, and that it adds up to social crisis, social limits, natural limits, ecological crises into systemic crisis. I don't think it does. And I think that there are important issues at stake here. I don't think that this is purely an academic uh, uh, discussion. I think that this has uh, key uh, key political stakes involved in, in thinking through the Anthropocene or Age of Man or Capitalocene, Age of Capital. So how are we going to think through the role of geological and biogeographical change in history? How do we think through the relations between human and extra-human natures in what Tom mentioned, the Great Acceleration? And if you've ever seen these so-called hockey stick charts, you all see them go like this and then up for one, one vector after another, CO2 emissions, urbanization, number of automobiles, you name it. But we need to think through how that works. Seeing the description isn't enough to forge an effective politics or an effective historical interpretation. And we need to think through seriously the question of limits. What is being limited? How, how are the limits forming? All civilizations have limits. So the idea that capitalism is confronting a historical limit today is not a particularly controversial statement. We need to, however, ask, is this a kind of crisis that looks, say, more like that of the late 18th century, the era of the Industrial Revolution, which are many problems, some of which I will touch on later in this talk? Was it a crisis that could be resolved by new frontier movements, new investments, new technologies, new imperialisms, and all the rest of it? Or is it perhaps an ethical crisis, uh, more akin to that of medieval Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries? So. We need to be clear about the different kinds of Anthropocene conversations going on. One is a geological argument. It's around golden spikes. 
When do we see it in the record? And how do we know it in the geological record? And there have been a lot of important uh, arguments around that. I'm particularly pleased by Maslin and Lewis's proposition of what they call the Orbis spike or global spike, which focuses on the peak die-off of American indigenous peoples in, in the uh, uh, early 17th century. That gets us into the domain of how humans and nature fit together in these big questions of crises. But this question of periodization is really, really important because if we start the clock in 1800 with the steam engine and coal, we are led to a very different kinds of, kind of politics than if we start in the era of Columbus, of the English and, and Dutch agricultural revolutions, of the emergence of modern banking and mar modern financial systems and all the rest of it. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in a few minutes about why this early modern era is so important and how we've really been blinded to even considering it. The, the, the automatic uh, response of, I think most, most radicals when it comes to the source of environmental crisis is, well, it all starts with industrialization. Well, that's far from clear. And by the way, it is certainly clear that, that from about 1830 to 1850, we do clearly have a quantity quality shift in world economic history. The era of the so-called industrial revolution is hugely significant. But our understanding is impaired if we just assume that that is the starting point. And we need to understand, we need to look at the history of humans on this planet, especially over the past five centuries, not just through the lens or the focus on consequences. We need to look at the relations of thought and of power and of capital uh, as they fit together. So if environmentalists Critiques often focus on, this, on the environmental consequences, quite properly. We also need, and I think now we can, to put the questions of the relation to power and capital and thought in there as well. All right, so we've gone through some of this, this already, that, that what happens is that, that the search for golden spikes here tends to get mixed up with an explanation of the history of ecological crisis tends to unfold on these so-called anthropogenic drivers. Part of the problem is that this concept, anthropogenic, is in itself incredibly misleading because these are not anthropogenic drivers. They are capitalogenic drivers, OK? It's not humanity as a whole that somehow propelled urbanization, industrialization, population growth. No, it is the transformation, the capitalist-led and colonial-led transformation of urban life, of industrial life, of family formation across the world that led to these uh, uh, great acceleration moments. And so what we need to do is we need to understand that geology, geo geological facts are not historical facts. They are, in, in the words of uh, uh, the great historian Edwin Hallen, E.H. Um, e. Carr, they are basic facts that help us start to see historical facts, that is, power, patterns of, of patterns of power and reproduction and production in the life of civilization. We need to see that there is indeed a, a long-term history that we need to look at. And we need to look, understand that coal is just a rock in the ground. How it becomes fossil fuel has to do with the relations of capital's production, class relations, and knowledge and expertise in other ways. So we cannot just assume that, relate, that resources do particular things, that leads us into a historical dead end, a kind of environmental determinism. We need to move from geology, the Anthropocene, to history, the history of humanity over the past five centuries through the optic of the age of capital, the Capitalocene. So, why the Capitalocene? Because the Anthropocene argument poses questions it cannot answer, and because we cannot address any crisis today without understanding the origins of that crisis. And if we get the origins wrong, we're going to get the politics of the present wrong. So we need to be very serious about history. And this is something that I found that even many Anthropocene uh, advocates and even many critics don't really want to touch. They don't want to touch the historical development of capitalism. And that's a mistake, because if we start the clock in 1784 with the rotary steam engine, we have a very different view of history than if we start with the English and Dutch agricultural revolutions, Columbus, and uh, uh, so on and so forth, after 1450. And this discussion around the Anthropocene has really proceeded largely without much 
as I've indicated, without much historical analysis. We have uh, a series of very sort of modernist procedures where time comes to substitute for history. This is the great hockey stick uh, 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 image that we get from the, from the great acceleration. Space really largely disappears. Uh, uh, that ge I mean, sp uh, space appears uh, at the expense of geography, and the quantification substitutes an analysis of the historical relations of power and reproduction. So that doesn't say that time, space, and quantification are unimportant. They are, but we need to be more astute about how all those fit in. So how do we move beyond the Industrial uh, Revolution as the sort of line in the sand for understanding modern ecological crisis. Well, we're going to start by, by moving beyond green arithmetic, by moving beyond capitalism plus nature to understanding capitalism in nature or capitalism and the world as world ecology. So when we say capitalism and, and capital Ocene, I do not mean merely an economic system. In fact, the category of the economy is a fairly recent invention. It doesn't really come into widespread use until after World War II. And uh, we need to understand that it is about what we normally think of as economic relations, but so much beyond that. And it's so much beyond merely a social system, but a way of organizing nature. And the central contradiction, while well, there are many, but I would say the core tension is between the commodity system, which is always has to be expanding, always moving faster and faster, and the conditions of its reproduction, which are in the unpaid work and energy of humans and the rest of nature. So this is important, and indeed this is why the, the issues of imperialism are so important, including to our present, uh, uh, to our present uh, uh, conjuncture. We need to understand that this, this issue of the unpaid work of humans and the rest of nature has to be bigger than the zone of, of uh, commodification. So the capital C doesn't mean that we impose an ideal type on history, but that we take capitalism as a kind of way of thinking about history, as a kind of method that sees capital not as determining everything, but to use it as a kind of gravitational field that brings in more and more of planetary life into its vortex in sometimes productive and often destructive ways. And that capital itself is co-produced by human and extra-human natures. All right, so. We need to move from the double yes to a double internality. The yes, humans are a part of nature. Yes, we're going to analyze it as, as if it were separate. Well, what happens if we stop seeing that social life and ecological life are separate? What happens if we do that? Well, we can start to reveal these, these new connections of ideas, of power, of trade, of empire that are co-productive, that are forming uh, 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 within the, the soil and water and climate of the earth. And what we need to see is that nature, too, has a history in a way that goes beyond geological history and these long eras of the Holocene or uh, uh, other eras before that, that we look at how every phase of capitalism invents new historical natures that also invent capitalism. So I'm, I'm giving you a kind of paradox here. Uh, how we work this out is uh, 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 the subject of historical investigation. But this question of historical nature, new sciences come with every new era of capitalism. So uh, the era of uh, a British hegemony in the world system gives us uh, Darwin and the Beagle. It gives us the Kew Gardens. Uh, the era of neoliberalism gives us recombinant DNA technology. It gives us mapping the human genome. It gives us ways of mapping planetary space through remote sensing and satellites in a kind of totalizing way. So that what we know and understand, even about an, an external nature, is deeper and, and qualitatively different as well uh, than before. So what I'm doing in all of this is, is taking a long line of argument from largely Anglo-American uh, Anglo scholars, but not only philosophical critiques, such as the great geographer Neil Smith, uh, regional histories, like the great environmental historian Richard White, and moving beyond either meta-theory in the case of Smith or methodological reg regionalism and telling the environmental history of a particular region, to take these insights about capitalism as an organic machine, in White and Lewis Mumford's words, or Neil Smith 
in talking about the co-production of nature uh, and, and really saying, well, what are the implications of these? And by the way, Neil Smith was always against constructionism, so what, what is sometimes called social constructionism. And he's sometimes confused as making that argument, but it's worth uh, making a footnote there. So what's missing from all this? Well, we need to, to understand that the history of capitalism, which is so important to understanding our present moment, is more than uh, just understanding the general context. It's understanding the evolution of a particular place and seeing how human and extra-human work fit together in this process. And at the center of this conversation, as I've tried to show, is you know, uh, the kinds of conversations that really put work at the center of our thinking about nature and putting nature at the center of our politics about work. I think that uh, of, of how, how we understand work. And I think if we wanted to boil down the red-green conversation for the past four decades, it has really been groping towards something that looks like these questions around work and nature and power and value. And it's taken a lot of different forms. Uh, but I think that that is really at the heart of it. So when we think about the origins of capitalism and the rise of a capitalist world ecology, we need to get away from Big Bang theories, which are most of the theories of the origins of capitalism, uh, most famously perhaps uh, Robert Brenner and Emmanuel Wallerstein. But I would highlight three epical shifts and to understand this as a long transition in which sometimes transformations of class are decisive, sometimes of money and markets, sometimes of technologies, sometimes of science, sometimes of empires. We need to understand that history is about living in the mess and making sense of messy, uh, uh, diverse historical processes. So uh, what we see with the rise of capitalism are three epical shifts. We see a transition from holism, that is, we are all part of one single order, to dualism as the organizing principle of power and profit. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, humans, since the Greeks and undoubtedly before, hadn't been talking about the distinctiveness of humans. Humans are distinct. But dualism is about a separation around what is and how do we know. And in Moose, we see a move from land productivity to labor productivity as the decisive metric of wealth. So in medieval Europe, the crucial question was how much rye or wheat could you grow on a hectare of land? Under capitalism, it becomes how much wheat, wheat or rye can you grow uh, in an hour of labor? And finally, from nature as the source of wealth to nature with the uppercase as the condition of wealth, that is the providing of the use values necessary for the, for the emergence of a regime of value, of abstract social labor. And this means that we need to understand how the rapid emergence of nature society dualism become an organizing principle of power and profit. And not just nature humanity, but also Europe and the Americas. The most Eurocentric argument one can make is that of an eternal civilizational essence in Europe that led to their uh, uh, rise to power. Indeed, we need to understand that when Columbus sets foot on Hispaniola in 1492, he is inventing not only the Americas, but also Europe. That, of course, compresses a very complex history, but there's something to that. So what I want to say here is that nature and society, with the uppercase N and S, are uh, dripping with blood and dirt every bit as much as the emergence of bourgeois and proletariat. So this is important. In the English language, and I'm, I'm talking with my colleagues across Europe and across the world about how this word society in general, as in Croatian society, German society, um, American society, becomes used. In English, society becomes common only in its general sense only after the mid-16th century. What happens? First, the, def the defeat of Ket's Rebellion, the high tide of agrarian resistance to uh, capitalist transformation on the countryside. We see the intensification of English colonial rule in Ireland after 1541. Uh, uh, we see the onset of the English coal revolution. And we see really the acceleration of primitive accumulation in the English countryside, such that labor is expelled from uh, agriculture very, very fast. Non-agricultural and urban population grows nearly twice as fast as the agricultural population. We also have a Cartesian revolution after Rene Descartes' famous separation of two substances, of mind and body. And by the way, I don't want to pick on, on Rene Descartes too much. Uh, we could come up with other names for this, maybe a Baconian-Newtonian dualism. Uh, we could, we could uh, uh, quibble over that a lot. 
But for the moment, I think uh, uh, what we see very clearly in this era are three major shifts. Privileging substances over relations, privileging either or ways of thinking over both and, and favoring the purpose of control over nature by applied science. In Descartes' words, we must make ourselves the masters and possessors of nature. Yes, indeed. And uh, we could ask also, who is the we that he's talking about? Uh, the project of early modern scientific revolutions, which were, of course, no, uh, famously complex, but here I would include also the Iberian revolutions of uh, collecting information about plants and animals across the world. There were basically three major points. To see nature as external, that's very helpful if you want to make nature into something cheap. Space is flat, so you can map the world, and you can only go upon, you can only embark as a civilization on a, on a project of global conquest by looking at the globe and conceiving the globe, which was indeed an invention of this era. So modern cartography and, and uh, modern practices of surveying, we have no private property and land without those two revolutions. And then time is linear and repeatable. Here, I would highlight Lewis Mumford's great phrase that the clock, not the steam engine, is the key machine of modernity. So you have to have these moments in play that are vital to this weird kind of productivism that puts the whole of the planet, all of planetary life potentially, at the service of capital accumulation. And here, as I mentioned, the rise of capitalism marks not only the expulsion of peasants and indigenous peoples from the land, but also their expulsion, the expulsion of most human beings from humanity. So that's really, it's really important to be aware of when we use these, these concerns. Okay, now we've gone this far. We have, the, we have the theory, we have the philosophy, we have the ideology, but what about the trees and the bees and the soils and the rivers and everything else? Well, let's get to that. So the scale, speed, and scope of, of, of environmental change after 1450 exceeded by an order of magnitude in many cases the environmental transformations of medieval Europe. So in other words, no steam engine was necessary to accelerate the scale the scope and the speed of environmental transformation by one order of magnitude, that is by 10 times. So if comparable scales, so bigness of change, have been seen before, you can think of the Great Wall in China, of the pyramids in Egypt, many other projects, nothing had moved over time and space quite so rapidly and on such a big, gigantic scale. Here's one of my favorite stylized facts. In medieval Picardy, it took 200 years to clear 12,000 hectares of forest. Four centuries later, that is in the 1650s, 12,000 hectares of forest would be cleared in a single year. So this was thanks to the sugar plantation model and the labor of indigenous and African peoples. So we need to put that into context when we think about the enormity of the changes that occurred after 1850. We need to ask, what were the relations of environment making in this broad sense that I'm talking about that made possible the great hockey stick charts that we see uh, featured in the great acceleration uh, narrative of the Anthropocene? So here, what I want to say is, yes, earth moving is huge. I just highlighted that, and we're going to get some more examples in a moment. Yes, you did have mechanization, and the earliest forms of mechanization were quite extraordinary and often resembled large-scale industry, and they, they largely uh, were, were rooted in places like sugar planting, where nature was cheap, mining of various mining and metallurgy in various ways, where nature was cheap, uh, shipbuilding, the great shipbuilding advances of the Dutch, which, by the way, included uh, automating skilled saw, um, uh, which included automating the sawmillers, the the sawyers, out of jobs by using water-driven uh, mills uh, on the basis of cheap timber from Norway. See, we have layers upon layers of this process. But we also need to to understand. And this will appear very obvious. I know that many of you are involved in cultural work and cultural politics of various kinds. Ideas matter. Ideas aren't just superstructure. That, that capitalism goes about transforming the world, not just because it has the machines to do it and the labor that it can set in motion, but because it has ideas about how to organize and reproduce large scale, global scale uh, power and production. So here we're dealing not just with technologies, but with, but with techniques.
That is, techniques understood as knowledge and power, nature and machinery fitting together at every turn. So to see the rise of capitalism as a world ecology implies a revolution in earth making and commodity exchange and all that, but also in ways of seeing and ways of knowing reality. Uh, Max Weber's European rationality of world domination should be taken as, serious, uh, as seriously as possible and indeed reminds me of uh, Marx's offhand observation that IT ideas too can become a material force. So. We have these new measures of reality coming in. Nature is external, space is flat, time is linear. But we also have very rapid and radical transformations of environments. The internal agricultural revolutions that is internal to the core of Europe in the low countries and then in England. We have a mining and metallurgical revolution that involved hundreds of thousands of workers in Central Europe, Northern Europe and England over this period. Uh, that, that consumed the, the forest at an unprecedented pace, uh, but, uh, like I said, about an order of magnitude uh, faster and larger than the medieval era. We have the pace of the sugar frontier. The sugar frontier, which begins in the 1450s in the islands of Madeira, uh, then goes across the Atlantic to Brazil and then to the Caribbean, does something never before seen. Uh, you're going you're gonna to wonder why, why uh, uh, Jason, are you showing me this chart of dates from the uh, 16th and 17th century if what we want to understand is a crisis of the planet today? Well, I'm going to tell you why. No civilization had moved in these 50 to 75 year cycles across planetary global space in the history of human, human, humanity. None of these not until the 1820s and 30s in Cuba and Jamaica do they have the steam engine. And indeed, the transformations here and here of uh, uh, Barbados and, and Jamaica uh, and the sugar plantations, those transformations provided the capital necessary to make the Industrial Revolution. That is, the textile mills of Manchester were built on the mass graves of African slaves and the devastated forests and soils of Barbados and Jamaica. So, and yes, by the way, the frontier in Africa uh, moved, the slaving frontier in Africa moved every time the sugar frontier moved because there was an endless, con uh, endless thirst for cheap nature in the form of African slaves. And you can look at mining in Potosi, that is colonial Peru, of New Spain, present day Mexico, as uh, uh, c constantly churning over new sources of, uh, of human nature, of labor power, of the resources necessary to, to produce the metal, to ship it across uh, the planet, and then to uh, transform divisions of labor elsewhere. For instance, if there's no Potosi silver, there is no transformation of Southeast Asia, where the Dutch do exactly what the Spanish do in colonial Peru. That is, uh, uh, seize production, reorganize production, expel natives, reorganize native populations, uh, all in the interest of uh, uh, profit and power. Uh, but this was not merely a story of what happened outside of so-called Europe, but also a story of the extended Baltic from southern Norway to Russia across this era that indeed we see the same process of the remaking of land and labor across in, in uh, within Europe uh, that we see in the Americas. This includes the conquest of the oceans. Of course, today we're dealing with the ongoing collapse of fisheries and of uh, the acidification of oceans. So there is a line, uh, 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 a line of uh, connection there. And uh, everywhere, of course, we saw uh, transformations of world forests. The last of these are now being hacked down in the Amazon, in Borneo, and other places. And let's not forget that uh, coal is not an invention of the 18th century, but an invention of the 16th century. And finally, the Columbian Exchange. Uh, there would have been no industrial revolution uh, across the long 19th century without maize and without potatoes, which, of course, are the epical uh, crops uh, offered, uh, offered up through the process of New World Conquest. So we need to have a reckoning of how work and labor productivity fits 
within the questions of environmental history. And this is so important because we have to move beyond, and I think eco-socialists and feminists and greens have been saying this for a long time, we need to move beyond the figure of the white male factory worker, that we need a conception of how work is organized in capitalism in a sustained and uneven, in a sustained and systemic and uneven way. And that means that we need to look at how forms of, of paid and unpaid work, of human and extra human work are fit together. But here I just want to say for those who say, well, okay, maybe all of that is true uh, about the early modern era, that there was all this transformation of landscapes, that it was awful, but really it still wasn't capitalism because uh, the great advances of labor productivity hadn't occurred. Well, indeed they had. And here I won't go through every moment of this, but basically what I've done here is say in shipbuilding, in metal making, in sugar planting, in agriculture, in printing, uh, in uh, uh, all sorts of, of mining, in the, the development, uh, in the spread of water mills, of windmills and everything else, of spring driven clocks, you have uh, what amounts to a massive revolution in mechanical uh, application, that is in industrialization. But this was also an era in which, which, which Europeans began to see nature in a way that we all understand as profoundly normal and natural. If you think of the contrast between medieval painting, for instance, and Renaissance painting, uh, that and the, the use of geometry and the ways of, of, of standing outside a, a world that is being represented, but pretending that that representation is uh, somehow neutral, we have, we have to look at how knowledge was transformed in, in this era. And this includes, uh, uh, you know, that the, the Dutch East India Company, in fact, uh, started, uh, I think they explicitly called it a geography department, but all great empires, one of the first things they start to do is map the world. Because if you want to understand the world, if you want to put nature to work, you have to map it. And, and this is also central to the story of Dutch and English agricultural revolutions, of surveying, of controlling environments, um, especially in the waterlogged uh, uh, regions of the Low Countries. But time, too, was radically uh, rationalized. And we saw uh, in the case of uh, the Dutch Republic in 1574, the Reformed Church abolished all holy days and extended the work year by 20%. So uh, European workers were not always doing uh, all that great, although by relative standards much better, of course, than the indigenous peoples. This is also when we see world money, world nature emerge as the Amsterdam uh, Bourse and the Amsterdam Exchange Bank invent fiat money uh, provided uh, um, or made possible by the transformation of, of Peru and Potosi, and the silver is the basis of this. Just like in the 17th century there was a silver standard today, we have an oil standard. And so world money, we can't abstract from the questions of world nature, world power, world ecology. All right, so now we're gonna, we're gonna spend the last 10 minutes or so closing out this and, and to try to chart out the problems of capitalism and nature, capitalism in nature, nature in capitalism uh, from the 1970s. The first is the decline of what they call the world ecological surplus. This is, uh, uh, that is, uh, the capacities of capitalism to set new massive volumes of cheap nature, food, energy, raw materials, and so forth, uh, into, into work for capital. That was partly resolved in the 1970s and 80s, but only partly, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, the other part is that now we have what I call the rise of negative value. That is, forms of nature, including human social movements, that cannot be resolved through the old productivist fixes. So this includes essentially climate change. Climate change is not fixable in the old techno-determinist ways. It is not conducive to being fixed by a European rationality that is a rationality of fragments. It is not a rationality of holes, as Elmer Allfather uh, makes clear in his essay in this book, Anthropocene or Capitalism. But we also see in agriculture the emergence of, of super weeds that are resisting the herbicide regimes of Roundup Ready. We are seeing new diseases emerge, most famously recently, of course, uh, uh, Zika. Uh, but uh, Rob Wallace has uh, uh, recently published a book uh, 
uh, on, on this topic of the emergence of new diseases in the context of neoliberal capitalism that is, well, frankly, quite terrifying alongside the terrifying issues of climate change and mass extinction. But what we're also seeing is the emergence of what they call a new ontological politics, which is a bit of a, a, bit of a mouthful. Uh, but food sovereignty, climate justice, degrowth, etc. I think these movements are challenging this productivist and dualist uh, uh, ontology, this theory of existence that is given to us uh, uh, by capitalism and that capitalism relies upon. So the neoliberal era did restore cheap nature. It reduced the prices for metals uh, by nearly half between 1975 and 89, uh, food by 39%, and still further uh, uh, went, went still, the prices for food still went still lower after 1989. Oil was stabilized for about 20 years after 1983. Uh, not coincidentally, by 2003, you see the first signs of world economic instability that would uh, uh, culminate in the, in the events of 2008. And of course, labor costs were dramatically reduced by the class offensive of capital against labor in the global north, but also in the global south, as Naomi Klein has made quite clear. Uh, I would put nature into uh, the, the questions of labor and labor into the questions of nature. We have now a decades-long wage repression across most of the global north. We have uh, 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 the uh, falling rate of profit in American and uh, uh, other zones of the world economy led towards the global factory. That for a time was a boom, but it uh, entailed the uh, simultaneous deindustrialization of core states and the rapid industrialization of the global south. This is now better recognized than it once was, but the global factory depended upon the great global enclosures that began in the early 1980s and the great doubling with the opening of India, the Soviet Union, and China uh, uh, to world, uh, uh, world production, world labor markets after 1989. Uh, today, we are seeing uh, an issue of contraction, of demographic contraction today that is of great concern to the world business press. Um, but we also seen, and this is central to the feminist dimension of world ecology and to my, my arguments that I haven't been able to do full justice to, but the, the great proletarianization after 1989 was an even greater expansion of the female proletariat. And here uh, I would emphasize Melissa Wright's uh, uh, signal contribution in highlighting the, in her words, the disposable third world woman worker as a fundamental pillar of neoliberal capitalism. That has to be understood within this tension between paid and unpaid work, or between the exploitation of, uh, of uh, uh, labor and the appropriation of unpaid work. Well, what's happened since 2003? Well, quite a lot. And these are complicated by the most recent period in which the, the central banks keep uh, pushing down the rate of interest. So there is always a fifth cheap in play, which is cheap money, cheap credit. Of course, cheap credit for the rich, not for the rest of us. So uh, since 2003, what did we see? We saw the commencement of the longest, the most volatile, and the widest in scope commodity boom uh, since uh, uh, over the past century. That is, the cost of oil production, uh, uh, the cost of uh, new capital invested in oil, uh, and the return on investment increased between five and tenfold. That is, if in the 1990s you put one dollar of new investment down, you would get one barrel of new oil back. Today you have to put ten dollars down to get one oil, one barrel of new oil back. So cheap oil is not going to last long. Enjoy it while it's here. We are seeing a situation in which uh, oil producers uh, across the world, but especially in the United States, are teetering on the verge of bankruptcy. The private oil producers, the state ones, will of course survive. Labor costs, of course, have been skyrocketing, especially in the heartland of world production. Uh, China, uh, real wages are uh, increasing very, very sharply. And today, uh, in contrast to the situation 40 years ago, runaway factories have nowhere, well, nowhere big to run. They can go to Cambodia, but Cambodia is, or Bangladesh or Vietnam are much smaller than China. Uh, metals metals uh, 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 remain a thorny problem because it's hard to get uh, loan money to, to involve, uh, to develop metal, uh, new mining projects, which often take 10, 15, 20 years to get going. Uh, we have ongoing problems with metal and food. Food is really the linchpin because the price of food and the price of labor are very, very close. 
to each other. Cheap food is never coming back, and it's never coming back for a lot of reasons. One big reason is climate change. You already have global warming implicated uh, in the yield suppression of the big four grain crops, soy, maize, rice, and wheat. We see the continuing failure of the GMO uh, revolution, which is not really very revolutionary, to revive productivity growth. And we have uh, the emergence of food justice, food sovereignty movements, which say the right to nutrition, the right to, co to uh, food as a cultural choice, and the right to live in a sustainable and democratic world are inseparable from each other. So that is a powerful challenge. And these are not the only uh, food justice and food sovereignty, of course, are not the only movements. But I think that sensibility has really spread far and wide, even if the politics are not always as radical as they want. I think it's far more than just uh, community-supported agriculture and uh, uh, other fairly uh, mild uh, uh, projects like this. I think we need to understand that without cheap food, there's no modernity, uh, but maybe something better. All right, so now we, we conclude where we uh, started from. We need to move beyond nature society as a, an abstraction that is treated as real. We know it's not real, but we treat it as such. It's a real abstraction. And that we need to, to see how capitalism has valued some people's lives over others, some people's work over others, and what system of power and production reinforces that. Um, we're going to look at five propositions on the way to closing out. We're going to say appropriate, uncapitalized nature as a force of production that is absolutely central. That is the process of frontier appropriations. That is, go to the frontier and by force or by science or by rationality or by markets, find and put cheap natures to work for free or low cost. We need to understand that there are limits to how far labor power can be uh, uh, expanded. Indeed, we see this with the growth of precarity and informalization all across the world, not least across the global south with the rise of what Mike Davis calls surplus humanity. So we need to, to keep in mind this, this reality of capitalism as islands of commodification within oceans of cheap nature. And that relation is coming undone today. That socially necessary labor time forms through both relations of exploitation. It forms both in the factory and at home and in the unpaid work of natures. And the value relations, the value is a systemic relation. It's not merely an economistic moment. It has a pivotal economic moment, but it cannot be reduced to that. And we need to deal with the state. I am all for horizontalism. I consider myself a uh, kind of libertarian socialist, uh, but we cannot, in an era of climate change and mass extinction, we cannot get away from the state. And here I would cite, I think, the, the groundbreaking work of my colleague Christian Parenti in talking about the territorial state as an environment-making state and the necessary political membrane, in his words, to the cyclical reinventions of world nature, world power, and world capital. So. We need to ask ourselves, what kind of crisis are we in today? A developmental crisis through which new rounds of commodification and marketization will resolve the problem, or an ethical crisis that would result in the transition from one mode of producing power, wealth, and nature to another? So we need to ask this. What kind of crisis are we in? Do the same conditions obtained today that obtained a century ago, or even in the era of neoliberalism, and that we need to get smart about the politics of this. And in my view, the politics of emancipation and sustainability have to stop drawing lines between human well-being and the well-being of the planet. We have to see this as a fundamentally uh, connected uh, process. So we're going to sort of telegraph through here that frontiers are, it's true, not just there, they're, they're actively produced, but they can't just be conjured up. So it's not just privatization that can be endlessly repeated again and again and again. Yes, you can privatize and hand out state and public goods uh, to the rich, either directly or indirectly, but that that is a necessarily limited uh, process. And that we need to understand that the, the problem of over-accumulation and of too much money chasing too few investment opportunities is a problem of the diminishing frontier. That if you think about it, the great eras of capitalist boom in which it was easy to make a profit, to invest rising sums of capital and, and uh, earn a profit, that those eras always turned upon great 
volume, great reservoirs of cheap nature, coal, oil, the Americas, the conquest of India, so on and so forth. So the great movements in, the ter in, in, in absolute terms of appropriating cheap nature, uh, uh, which has really been identified very well, I think, by the lexicon of radical scholars, shock doctrine, biopiracy, bio new enclosures, all of that. And then we need to, to put in, into conversation the relatively anemic pulse of world accumulation. Above all, no great advance in labor productivity. We were supposed to have robot factories. What happened to the robot factories? Uh, uh, the robots were supposed to do all our work. No, those haven't come. They won't come. Uh, and indeed, no secular reset of production costs in a major way. So. We need to look at, yes, there are some old patterns, but also new patterns. No great surge of labor productivity growth. That's a big new pattern. Ongoing stagnation of capitalist agriculture, that is a new pattern. Uh, the productivist stagnation, the reason why we've seen such radical dispossessions all across the world is because agriculture and industry, industrial labor productivity growth have essentially stalled out. Climate change is inducing not just the end of the frontier, but a great frontier in reverse. And uh, we've, we've reached, uh, if we think about the work of uh, Giovanni Arrighi and David Harvey, um, two of my teachers, that we can think of a tipping point of what he calls the great power or world hegemonic cycle. But also David Harvey's, uh, uh, I think, underemphasized tipping point of rising geographical inertia. That is, capitalism becomes less flexible, not more over time. We have rising costs of production across the board in extractive and energy sectors. That's an old pattern and a possible tipping point uh, in a three decade or so long cycle of cheap money and cheap credit. So, is this hopeful or pessimistic? Well, I'm not a big fan of capitalism to begin with, so I see capitalism as on the way out. I see that as a very hopeful development, and indeed, the destabilization of the powerful tends to open up new possibilities for uh, uh, justice, emancipation, and so forth. I think that's the history uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of the age of democratic and industrial revolutions in the late 18th century, but we can go much farther than that. Indeed, often so-called civilizational collapses, uh, uh, the uh, direct producers do very well in Western and Central Europe after the collapse of Roman power in the 14th century after the collapse of feudal power, uh, uh, living standards increases. So uh, crises are dangerous, but also moments of opportunity. Thank you.